back up there. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm going to call our meeting to order. Uh, this is the March 12th meeting of the Addison Central School District Board. Um, do a quick round of introductions before we get started. Uh, this is the first meeting that we've had since uh, town meeting day and um, one thing that's uh, great is that we get to welcome three new board members all of whom are sitting to my right and we'll begin with uh, introductions at the far end however then would you begin Peg Martin Jory Jacobite Davina Damore I'm Peter Conlon Peter Burrow superintendent Lorraine Morse Chip Malcolm Chris Keaton Victoria Jetty Josh Quinn, business manager. Kate Steele, director of teaching and learning. Vicki Wells, assistant superintendent of student teaching. That's Vicki Wells at the end, who's uh, suffering a severe voice loss. <laughs> director of student services and assistant superintendent. Uh, before we can go any further, uh, since this is the start of sort of a new school board session, we have to reorganize, which means we have to uh, elect chair, vice chair, and clerk and uh, with the nomination process and all that. So as chair, I need to now turn the gavel over to the vice chair, Lorraine Morris. Uh, I will take nominations for chair position. Nominate Peter Conn. Second. Okay. Any other nominations? Okay. All in favor of Peter Conlon for board chair, say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, I will now open the floor for nominations for vice chair. We'll Lorraine, Morris. Lorraine Morris has been nominated. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Hearing none, all those in favor of Lorraine Morris as vice chair, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Thank you. And we've elected Lorraine as vice chair. Uh, our third position is clerk. Do I hear any nominations for clerk? I would nominate Suzanne Buck. I have a second. Second. Any other nominations for clerk? Hearing none, all those in favor of electing Suzanne Buck as clerk, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? And we have refilled our elected positions. Um, you'll see on your agenda that there's one called recording secretary. We traditionally have not um, done recording secretary, so we'll... Um, Put that aside. We're going to make a couple of adjustments in our agenda just to accommodate folks who have come. Uh, we're going to um, push off uh, establish, talking about committee assignments and board meeting date and time, as well as um, a couple other things so we can get to some presentations. But before we begin with those, uh, at the beginning of each of our meetings, we always open with a, a public comment period. Uh, this is a period for folks who wish to uh, make comment to the board to do so. Um, we use this time to listen. Uh, we don't uh, engage in a debate with those who want to make comments to us. We're really just here to listen to what folks have to say. Um, and this is before we get into the rest of the board meeting, which is really a conversation among board members. So I would uh, welcome those who would like to comment or raise their hand. I'll kind of try to go in order and uh, we can go from there. Is there anybody here for public comment? I know we've got kids making a presentation. We've got a presentation on uh, some tree planting. Yes, if you can just give us your name and, and what town you're from. My name is Jesse. I'm from Bridgeport. Last name? Got a child in... I'm sorry, your, your full name? Jessica Norris. Thank you. I have a child in high school and one in Bridgeport as well. Um, I 
a lot of, let's wait and see. We haven't figured that out yet. Um, and as a parent who likes to stay on top of what her kid's schedule is like so that she can make sure he graduates by the time he's in the, at the end of 12th grade, it's a little frustrating. Um, so really, the only reason I came to this meeting was to let you know that I think that by pushing the 10th graders into it and not starting it at, say, freshman level, we're, um, as a school district, painting ourselves into a corner. Since then, I have had one answer to one of my many questions. Um, so I will say that they are working on it, but I am just concerned with with how quickly it's, it's moving without a lot of answers to questions. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, my name is Barbara Carley, and I just had a wisdom tooth out today, so this is a bit hard to check. Um, I am the librarian at the middle school, and um, and I am retired in Massachusetts. Um, but I just wanted to, I, I wrote a letter to the editor. I have written to the school board concerning the proposed cut to the, the school library media specialist position at the middle school to half time, um, which is which is not according to the state standards. And I just want to reiterate how important that is besides being a librarian and being a, just so many things happen in the library. But also the idea that the state of Vermont recognizes that we should have a librarian, a certified librarian for this school and at 279 students that's still not 0.5 that's 0.93 so i um knowing that you're going to have to apply for a waiver if this goes through and knowing that waivers have been denied i am just i'm just urging people to be very concerned with that thank you thank you Bye. appreciate it yes uh Bill Kern, I live in Cornwall. Uh, clarification on uh, item G on the agenda, if I might. Um, it's actually two groups of the presentation. Rotary yes. Club is going to do a tree project, and Lions Club is going to do a pavilion. Yes. Separate, so. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. 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 Thank one thing that um, as a school board is travel from school to school uh, for the first meeting of the month and uh, what it benefits us for is we get to take a look at what's going on in each of these schools and uh, at each one we try to we encourage the school to provide us with a presentation and tonight we have one who's who's introducing Jen um, hi I'm Jen Kravitz I'm the principal and some fifth grade students who have been doing pretty cool projects um, all year of, that are based in inquiry um, and really um, student-generated student, student generated in many ways. So I'm going to let Andrew introduce them. But this is Andrew Hirsch, fifth grade teacher. My name is Andrew Hirsch, fifth grade, as Jen said. Now I'm going to introduce the students pretty quickly. Um, when they were given the chance to present tonight, the kids jumped at the opportunity and 11 kids volunteered to come on their own time Monday night here. There was very little arm twisting. Uh, after they said they would come, I did give a little homework or pre in the future, so these guys are going to have a nice time coming up. So I'm really proud that they came out tonight to share some learning. There's going to be three projects that are going to be shared tonight. The first is going to be this uh, fair trade economics project that we're engaged in. Uh, next, a couple of groups are going to share about the ecology project. Um, they're going to be pointing these posters in the back. And then finally, some boys are going to be talking about this recent change project uh, that we're looking at. The two projects after the uh, Fair Trade project are IB uh, related, this How the World Works unit that we worked on and just wrapping up. And the topic, of the, really the focus was that uh, change, affects, um, change affects systems was the central idea. So you'll see that come out throughout these presentations. And I think I'll let the girls get started on the chocolate fair trade economics project that we looked at. It's the overhead for us. And we're going to try 
going to recognize our time, they're going to condense the projects and sort of summarize their learning. So I have to bear with. And there'll be questions and answers after if you want to hold those. Can you guys introduce yourselves? I'm sorry. And that That'll thing go was on. off. And that's <laughs> I'm Ella. This is Clara. We'll be presenting a slideshow, Our Fair Trade Journey. It covers our journey from the book we read to our results. So the first step into our journey was reading a book called The Better Side of Sweet. The Bitter Side of Sweet was about three kids, Amadou, Sidhu, and Kadaija. Amadou and Sidhu had been working at a cocoa plantation for about more than two years. Suddenly, a girl named Kadaija comes and gives them the courage to try to escape. When we realized this book was based off a real situation in Ivory Coast, Africa, we took action. we read the book, we were so hooked and amazed that this is actually going on, that we had to learn more, so we decided to learn a little bit about fair trade. Some of the things that we learned are that the kids at the plantations are kidnapped and then put to work. Those kids get beaten, and some of the kids are as young as five years old. We also decided to find out a little bit more about the background. So we, where the story takes place is Ivory Coast. We looked at Ivory Coast. Each student did a different sort of project about Ivory Coast. Some of them included religion, the process of chocolate, resources and transportation. So after our research, we decided to send some letters. Everybody thought of who they wanted to send them to. Some people sent as many as three letters. Some people we sent them to are Senator Bernie Sanders, Representative Peter Welch, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, President Donald Trump. We also, me, Ella, and Sam had a play called How Do You Like a Child? And during the intermission, we also took action by doing a short presentation on fair trade. So about a month after we had gotten our letters in the mail, we got some back. Some people we got back from are Senator Patrick Leahy, Senator Bernie Sanders, and Representative Peter Welch. But we are still waiting for more. Now I will read an excerpt from a letter we got back from Senator Patrick Leahy. So Senator sentences we, how we wanted to point out were, thank you for contacting me about the cocoa industry and fair trade chocolate. I have long fought to inform, I have long fought to improve conditions for agricultural workers around the world and to reduce or end child labor. Thank you. The 
transform required is the back. The balance leads to the, is the jungle because the balance is only eternal berry bushes, but it can be cactuses. The purple berry bushes are pretty strict. The population size is 62,000 at all. The nutritional requirements is the, this plant needs no water. If given too much water, the plant will suffer, and the roots will stop collecting the minerals that the plant needs to live. There are problems with the forest fire and the client, the rainforest clients overheat because of the shade of the trees after the forest fire dies out, and desert clients are already accustomed to the heat. And the entomal mushrooms um, are not effective because in the part of the rainforest they are in, it's not effective by the fire. Um, the is run off to the desert that they have the cactuses there. Um, the purple berry bushes die, but around 36 of the purple berry bushes die. Um, and the way we think it's human to help is by reconnecting some of the vegetation and trees that in the rainforest and trying to get some of the animals to move back in. for all the animals. So the producer, the point of bush, the berries are poisonous. Producer, gasgas, thick leaves to provide protection for the primary consumers. The primary consumer, the firefish, color helps camouflage in the sand. Primary consumer, the weblog, dark specky fur to help camouflage. The secondary consumer, the feel, has large wings for vast escape tail for distraction and sharp beak to pick food for its young, also to defend itself, apex predator the swap, furry so can blend in with the, with the grass, venomous bite, strikes so suddenly without any harm due to its teeth, hooked ear so it has good hearing, the budget, longer legs so it can run faster, saliva that can get rid of poison from point of bush, the decomposer, Anoki, the roots come out from its capsule look stronger, black and brown spots to blend in with the swamp floor. Saprophyte, bacteria underwater to protect itself from this wake. So, our disturbance was we added mosquito poison, and the changes were the saprophyte becomes a poison to the water, and most of our other animals die off, and we, we would add birds, bats, spiders, and fish. So the mosquitoes, instead of putting the poison into the swamp, that would harm these animals. And we chose the swamp because it's a moist place that just so happened to be for mosquitoes to live mostly. And that's it. And the girls presented these fictitious ecosystems. The boys were speaking about our ecosystem, the world we live in, and they sort of looked at the problems that uh, they were most interested in solving and thinking about a way to uh, mitigate the problem and help our planet. So I'll let Tucker start us off. Um, so basically, what we were doing. He'll get it right. So basically what our project was that we've been doing for the last couple weeks was we have to make a, we don't have to make it, but we do something to change the world. And it's based off of the idea about how change affects systems. And that's it. What I did was I made a fruit. Well, my idea was to make a fruit that could help people by its health. The problem 
that is happening is obesity. My ingredients would be banana, strawberry, and watermelon, and If you can mix the DNA between the fruits, it could make combine to make a better fruit than all of the ones separate instead of three different fruits. Um, if you have the three different fruits with all the nutrients and the minerals and the nutrition within all of the fruits, and you put them together, it would be higher and. This is the list of impacts or effects on the world after it. It would be health, increasing jobs, job loss, feeding the poor, and weather. I'll show One of the impacts is health, is health because all the nutrients and stuff that's in all the fruits would emerge to make something better and it would cause less obesities and because the fruits are a key part to a healthy diet. Okay, so like Tucker was saying, we were working on a project that was like actually things that were happening in our, happening in our world. And I thought about transportation and how all the fossil fuels were burning off into the atmosphere. So um, I was thinking that electric cars could be the answer because um, so far in the last couple of years we've relied on fossil fuels to uh, power our transportation. So I was, so, um, oh yeah, so, but some people might be thinking like, it may be hard to have an electric car because there's not many charging stations and the range isn't too long, so because a normal car can usually get you longer. Um, but so I thought of a thing called the battery swap, which I think could make them more appealing to the buyers and people that want to help the environment. So um, how it works is pretty much the battery swap the batteries can hold up to 100 miles or more. Um, you can so in some of the cars you can put up to one to five batteries in them, and like right as one is about to die, the power switches to the other battery, and then you can just keep on driving without having to stop and switching them out. Um, so also the size they're pretty small, so like anyone can lift them. They are about 11 inches by six and a half, and then they're about four inches tall. So they're 11 inches long, six and a half uh, wide, and four inches tall. Um, oh yeah, so um, also you only have to buy one, or depending on how many your car can fit, you can buy five. But instead of having to like charge them every time, you put one in like there's these charging boxes kind of stations, and you put a battery in, and then one gets unlocked and it's already charged usually, and there'll be like seven at the place and then so you can just take one out and it will be fully charged. Um, oh yeah, so all the, the battery size will be, like the, all the cars will have the same size battery so you won't have to get a certain kind of battery for your car. Um, there, are stops, there are stops every 45 to 50 miles so it's not like you have to drive super long to get to another battery swap station. There are sometimes there can be art galleries or food or um, book station uh, bookstores at the battery shop places. So then you can stop and you can have some entertainment for a little bit. The cars can go up to 85, I mean 80 miles an hour about, and the batteries to buy one battery is about 25 dollars. Um, so I was thinking about the good and bad impacts. So some of the good ones will be, instead of paying the average price for gas, it's only a dollar to put one in and take one out. 
Uh, they're good for the, they're good for the environment because the stations aren't powered by gas. They're powered by sun, wind, or water, depending on what's near the stations, um, and it'll reduce the carbon dioxide that's in the environment. Some of the bads will be the taxpayers will have will pay for the batteries in the stations, and the, it'll be a lot of money at first. But then, if a lot of people get them, then it will be less. The cars are also they probably will start off as a lot of money because less people have them. But if they get bought more, then the price will lower. Oh, that's the end. <laughs> so I'm doing plant-based plastics for my change project. And so my idea is uh, regular acrylonitrile is a chemical with a toxic byproduct used to make plastic. And if you can make a like non-toxic version, then it would uh, help the environment. And uh, acrylonitrile is uh, made out of petroleum, so it's also has negative effects on the environment. And using a plant-based one would, like you could make like phones, computers, plastic bags, which we use like every day. And it would make them not have to like draw oil out of the earth. And this can happen by breaking down wheat straw, corn stalks, and other materials, uh, well, other plants, into sugar, and then turning it into an acid, and then adding a cheap catalyst to create it into a substitute acryl nitrate, which is uh, like the chemical that they use to make plastic, and also carbon fiber. Uh, my impacts are some of the good impacts is it helps the stop the use of acrylonitrate and petroleum and it also helps stop uh, the use of plastic shopping well the use of oil and plastics uh, stopping stopping fluctuation for uh, plastic prices because uh, since plastic is made out of oil when oil fluctuates plastic fluctuates and it can also be used for carbon fiber. And the producers can use farmers' old, not wanted corn stalks or wheat straw. And the bad is it might not be biodegradable, and the cost of initial production would also be a factor. And factories might need to be built. And also, people sometimes use corn stalks and uh, wheat straw for other uses. And that's it. My name is Christopher Townsend, and I'm doing a special type of watch. The problem is there are people with no homes that are suffering on the streets. So how it works is the NEX works by static electricity and Zen shoots out of the watch and gets attracted to the static electricity. The sand could harden by <coughs> liquid nitrogen also shooting out of the watch. The impacts are the money I make, I will buy land so people can live there and I'm going to give the watches to homeless people so they can make houses. And that's it.
So I thought of an idea of how I could change the world for good. So build a better world was my idea, and that's basically a, a kindness based. Like other people, their base was like doing things by cars and transportation, a food that you can eat to get healthier, stuff like that. So I took the kindness. So the process. Step one, you need to make an act of kindness for someone. Like anything from saying something nice, like how's your day, stuff like that, to like lending money. Um, and then you can make more than one act of kindness. And then you need to tell the person you have that they've been touched by the kindness script, which means you have to try to live your life as a better, kinder person. And then um, you need to tell them to tell the next person that they have, that they were touched by the kind of strand, and so on and so forth. So then, um, if you get touched by the, oh yeah, so the pros and cons are some good things that can happen is the world will become a better place with much kinder people, and there will be less deaths each year, and, oh, I didn't finish that one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was it? Less crime. Oh, yeah, like less crimes and like less homeless people. And then they're, they're, it's like, another good thing is there's no cons. So. <laughs> I would like to ask at least one. Uh, uh, the, the, the chocolate story, was, that was based on a true story. So how do I know if I'm getting chocolate from a place like that or from a, from a good production facility? There's a little symbol on the chocolate wrapper that will say, it'll be like a little person that says fair trade and some Chocolate brands will like really advertise fair trade everywhere. Some will just have it on the back. And I think on the last slide of the results, it was shown in the background. And I also, I'm going to just take my prerogative as a newly elected chair. <laughs> uh, in terms of um, the ecology talk, has there ever been an example you can talk about in Vermont where we've changed the ecology, where that and it's rebounded or, or caused future problems that you know of? If you don't have a specific answer, that's fine. <laughs> Maybe be more specific here. Well, have we ever, um, have we ever introduced an animal <coughs> uh, and all of a sudden that had an impact? That were the, an animal that didn't exist before? Or did we wipe out an animal? Yeah. I have one, um, mosquito poisoning, people put poisoning in swamps, and then, um, like, if so, so the mosquitoes die, and then somebody eats the mosquito, somebody eats that, it can transfer up into what we eat, and then somehow that could impact us, maybe. Um, another. Yeah. Um, uh, at Lake Champlain, around the Bermuda so the manure is going into the lake, and like there's parts of the lake that now like people can swim in, and a lot of fish are dying because of phosphorus. Phosphorus. Mm -hmm. What did you do with the family in the future? Um, another one that was being brought here was sea the mussels because of the ship that traveled here, and there was water in the bottom of the mm -hmm. Um also white perch, which are competitors with yellow perch. These are all like species? Yep. As mm -hmm. a board member, I'd like to make a comment relative to IB, which you referenced. Uh, I think this is a great example of taking knowledge from different places and trying to uh, bring it together, since that, to me, from my understanding of IB, is what we're going to try to get in a grander way, but certainly this demonstrates this uh, extremely well. Uh, we live in the world. We don't just live in Addison County. Or live in just a classroom. Or just live in the classroom with many fragmented things. So, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you all very much for the great to have to be able to come out here and be with all the kids. Thank you for being an audience.
going to interrupt our regularly scheduled program for just a quick second. Uh, our three board members just need to be sworn in. We're going to take a moment to do that. So our clerk, our district clerk, can then um, go on her way. So three of you just go uh, uh, join Linda Barrett right over there who's waiting you over to sign. Uh, okay. <laughs> Do I keep this morning? Yeah. I'll let her call me over if so. What? Uh, yeah. I do. Newly elected. Mm -hmm. I thought that was my good example. I'm glad you mentioned that. I just wanted to ask you. Our next topic, uh, a month or so ago I was contacted independently by two of our service organizations in town, Rotary and the Lions Club, and each, I think independent of one another, came up with um, some improvements that they would like to do to land that we essentially own. Uh, this is at the um, entrance to and then sort of work your way down to the warming hut, which is now the teen center, uh, entrance to Mary Hogan, and kind of working your way down. This is, this is property that we own but has largely been controlled by the town. But because we own it, we need to sign off on uh, changes over there. And uh, so we have two different proposals sort of uh, coming together at the same time, uh, some of the same people involved. Um, this is uh, not funded by taxpayers. Uh, it um, just seemed like it'd be a nice thing for us to talk about. Anyway, um, who who's going to speak? <laughs> um, Randy Bigelow from the Member Alliance Club and the president of the Member Alliance Club. Yeah, I've got a few presentations or a few handouts. Pass them in both directions. The, uh, we were challenged by Lions International because Lions International just is, uh, or is this, uh, this year completing its 100th anniversary. So we were asked by Lions International to consider some gift that we could give to our local community that would celebrate uh, the 100th anniversary of the Lions Club. Um, now, Middlebury Lions Club is only 60 years old, so we're talking about the international organization. Um, we were doing research and uh, uh, community needs assessment, and one of the things we came across was the uh, Middlebury Recreation Department's uh, capital plan. And we noted that, uh, that they had been looking at doing a pavilion for years, but it had been getting pushed back year after year after year um, for other capital needs, and that's very understandable. Um, we thought that would be a very appropriate gift for us uh, to gift to the town of Middlebury. Uh, you can see from their capital plan on the front that it's uh, the sighted uh, that's uh, on the other side of the, or on the, uh, on the, uh, as you walk towards the warming hut, um, with the, on, the, on your right hand side would be the baseball field. Um, you'd be able to enjoy the uh, picnic uh, barbecues and be picnicking on the pavilion. It'd uh, be a, a great uh, place for uh, gatherings and such. Uh, the capital plan on the top is not to scale. Um, we. Uh, we're trying to figure out what the appropriate size for our pavilion would be. The picture that you see on the second page is a similar pavilion in, in terms of construction methodology. It's basically a, a, just a, a pole building. Um, but uh, in terms of size, we uh, initially started out with a 20 by 40, but uh, we got the feedback that every year when we celebrate our graduation, we run a 30 by 60 tent. Um, so we were, we were encouraged uh, by that to go with a 30 by 40 foot structure um, and it's designed such that if at some point in the future you want to extend it to 30 by 60, that would be easily achievable. <clears throat> but the, the drawing is somewhat to scale in terms of a 30 by 40 draw, uh, rectangle on the uh, capital plan. So you can see basically the footprint that it would be uh, taking up in that area. Um, so. I guess that would be it. We're still working on a, on a uh, engineering, uh, um, on getting an, a, a, a structural engineer to sign up on our drawings. 
but it's basically going to be uh, a, an open uh, pavilion, uh, nice green metal roof because we're from Vermont. There you go. <laughs> they do have two, uh, last couple built two of them down in Castleton at the uh, Crystal Beach. So it's, it has been done before. Um, it's withstood quite a bit of weather and everything else. We do have the concrete floor underneath it, so we're going to be we're still debating that. Uh, the one additional thing I would say is that we're very sensitive to the fact that the, uh, the, the uh, uh, footprint that the building would take up is uh, called for in June for graduation. So we're either going to get permitting finished and have sufficient time to get this built for this year's graduation, or else we're going to delay all activities until after graduation and then break around that for after. We will have plaque inside too for name notification and donors and different things that will be honored at that time. Great. Questions? Steve. Um, I noticed that you have on the path here uh, that you're going to raise the path and install a culvert in there. There's quite a bit of that's a That's a lot of. This is the Rex plan? Yeah, that's the Recreation Department's uh, five-year capital, capital plan. Yeah, you were talking about the pavilion. Um, so what's the runoff going to do to that area? Because that's like really low with a lot of, you're, you're putting a hard surface there. Um, there. There will definitely have to be some regrading above it and below the structure. Okay. Um, but the, as far as the the current runoff into that, into that uh, ditch area, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that shouldn't impact that runoff because all that water runoff is currently going there already. That whole area is sloped to that ditch. It's a mess right now. I can imagine that. Yeah. It is. So, have you, have you been through the uh, the, the town route? Of, you know, rec department looked at this and signed off on it, and town of Middlebury's all. Yeah, all the rec department has signed off on this. Uh, yeah. Next stop will be, uh, my understanding is, uh, the infrastructure, and then through the zoning board and the select board. Uh, so we were asked to see you before we went to the infrastructure. Perfect. Um, and so board members, after we vote on this and assuming a positive vote, sort of the one condition we're going to just put on it is um, that they just run it by Bruce McIntyre, the director of facilities, to make sure that it's, there's no conflict there. Any other questions? Um, we'll, we'll do these one at a time. Yes, Suzanne. So I know that this is similar in style to the pavilion that's at... Um, where? Castle. No, I was thinking over at Basin Harbor, actually. Button Bay. Um, Button Bay. But I'm wondering, what are you going to do along the ridge, ridges to keep the birds from nesting in there? What we intend to do, uh, one of the significant differences from the from the picture that you see, it's only an eight foot height. We're raising it to 10 feet because we want to keep the kids as well as the birds okay. out of the raptors. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we're going to be lining the entire underside with a uh, half inch uh, uh, welded wire so basically, the the insects would be Congress, but the birds would be kept out. Thank you. All right. So, um, how about a motion that we approve the uh, Middlebury Lions Club Pavilion project on the um, on the property pictured before us? So moved. Second. Second. Great. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, more pictures. <laughs> My number is pretty soon. Uh, Bill Kernan, I'm a member of the Rotary Club, and I uh, only brought 10 copies, so um, I'm just to share. Um, uh, I'm also the director of operations for the town, so I have some oversight for uh, maintenance and stuff on, on these facilities and whatnot too. Um, but the Rotary Project, um, it's an international um, project. We plant one tree for every Rotarian, which uh, equals 1.2 million worldwide. That's what this uh, first pamphlet is about, some information on that. Um, this is completely funded by the Rotary Club. It's about $9,000 or something like that um, to help defray some of that, where I think we're going to uh, allow people to actually dedicate some trees and we'll put a 
a plaque out there. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to tag trees or not, but that's all our part of it. Um, there will be a dedication ceremony um, and a permanent um, a, a plaque again, but it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to talk a little bit about the story of this and then uh, about the local uh, initiative. Um, Can we take a moment to get folks oriented as to exactly yeah. what we're talking about? Yeah, the first the first map is as you walk it or as you drive into Mary Hogan, this is the area that we're looking at. Um, and what it actually is, it's a, uh, I don't know who might know Lily Snow, but um, she's very artistic and she wants, likes to call it a, a living sculpture. Uh, she's put this design together. It's going to be a, a, a grove of crab apple trees, um, various colors grouped together for visual effect. Um, they're going to be slightly raised on a bed of topsoil and they're going to have ground cover, uh, so there will be no mowing or anything associated with it. Um, and then our plan also is to uh, be able to get some of the uh, existing marble blocks uh, that are now part of the support for the existing bridges in town uh, they're big you know probably three by six or something like that place a few of those around here for benches to sit on and, and whatnot um, i think these might help with the, the uh, stormwater problem over there a little bit um, um, they're obviously going to take a fair amount of water so if you look at the this one is the actual layout where the trees are going to go and what shape they're going to be in. The planting schedule for this is roughly mid-May. Uh, we're hoping to incorporate uh, various groups in, in helping us. One would be the school. Um, I think Lily has already spoken with somebody over there. Um, get some kids out to help do some of the layout and whatnot. Um, Terrans himself will do most of the, the labor with some additional volunteers. Um, and then this final rendering is, uh, this is drawn by Lily. This is courthouse in the background and kind of, kind of similar to what it's going to look like. Like I said, there'll be groups of colors. Bill, care and maintenance of this falls on your department uh, as time goes eventually. on? It um, Rotary's going to um, put money in there, fund it for at least a couple of years to get, get these semi-mature. Uh, Lily will be doing the pruning. She'll probably show the Rotary Club how to do some of the pruning. Um, and then eventually it will be on the town to take care of it. So it's yeah. part of the, the rec park. So. Okay. Um, and we have a plan at, at least the first couple of years to water them as needed. So. Uh, when I met with uh, Lily uh, about this beforehand, um, she mentioned that you might incorporate some work on that on the sign that's out front that says Middlebury Recreation Park. I, I, I personally have uh, uh, some ideas on doing that. Um, I didn't really want to muddy this project up with that. But okay. Yes, I'll probably be coming back. Um, I, I'd like to open that space up so you can now see back into the park. Uh, that was first one of the first things I noticed when I doing research uh, for the job. I took this job a year and a half ago. Um, I was surprised at all the resources that were there, but it wasn't super yeah. welcoming. Um, so just kind of open it up a little bit, change the orientation of the sign, some of those beds out front stuff. But all right. You'll come there. back later with that. Yep. 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 And then that will actually open up an opportunity for us to talk about actually a Mary Hogan sign, which doesn't exist at that entrance. Yep. Um, all right. Any further questions? I assume that the rec department is on board with all this. <laughs> We're excited. All right. Uh, how about a motion then to approve the Rotary Club tree planting project? Motion. Second. Chip. Second by Chris. Any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor then, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? Again, uh, we just ask you to run it by Bruce. <coughs> Uh, beforehand, but um, to both of you and to your organizations, this is it's really wonderful. Thank you very much. Good nice addition. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now back to our 
more mundane business here. Um, how about a recommendation to approve the minutes of February 19th? Move. Lorraine, move that. A second. Thank you, Victoria. Oh, I'm going to say, sorry. Oh, all right. Well, you can still second. I'll second. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, like as well. All right, well, we'll have the vote and you can oh, abstain then. <laughs> uh, any discussion? Yes. Yeah, I, I have a few things just on the minutes, and I think there were a couple of things that, that came up to me that uh, I think we, uh, we just need to be a little tighter in the minutes. In, in the first part, under the public comments, there's quite a bit of discussion, uh, and both Natalie and Dottie Newberger we're making those uh, comments relative to the alternative education program. And I understand why uh, we would want to uh, incorporate those in the minutes, at least in a brief way. I just found it to be uh, a, a little bit undirected, okay? And I felt that it was too much too wordy for, the, for what was happening. That's the first part, this is a comment. Yep. Uh, the second part is, uh, has our student population really reduced from 1,200 to 530? It stated that in the, um, in the, with the fourth paragraph. It says our school population, this is... Uh, this is uh, a comment from Bill saying that the population at MUHS... Well, I don't know, Bill. It's not noted, honestly, that Bill said that. Okay. okay? So I, I was a little struck by that number, and I was also struck by I wasn't sure who was saying it. All right. Uh, and so that... And, and the third part, and this is sort of more discussion about minutes, uh, is under other, uh, where we had the uh, a fairly long discussion on the resolution that was presented to us on gun safety in schools. And... Um, that was a complicated issue, albeit. But in the discussion, as it's noted in these minutes, I find it very hard to, under, to, to sort of know. Uh, if we're going to make a point of, in the minutes about what something is said, then it either should be ex extremely brief, or we should actually note who is making that statement. I'll use it as an example. Just. It said, the resolution wants the assembly to ban the selling and owning of assault rifles in Vermont. Teachers and parents have lost patience with politicians to take action. Well, who said that? Uh, that may have been the gist of the information, but I think in a minute, I, find it, I, I found it to be very awkward. So uh, the board can decide whether they wish to leave all of that in as it is, or, uh, or lead later into a discussion as to what what should really I think be a more effective minute I understand the secretary's job to try to capture the moment but I found it reading those two long statements both about alternative ed and this having been there I felt really uh, not quite comfortable that I knew who was saying what and or, or whatever so uh. Comment appreciated. I think maybe uh, a longer discussion about what this board wants to have in minutes uh, might be in order, not tonight. Um, other than to say that um, if we are, I, I would agree that if, if there's a statement of opinion, that there really should be, that should be attributed to somebody. I, I think it, when we have our discussion, I would, I think we should use this as somewhat of an example of what we want to correct. Okay. Not usually one to argue on minutes, but yeah. it just struck me tonight that I wasn't comfortable with this. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, I guess I would, unless we can verify the numbers, recommend striking the numbers uh, or whoever provided them in the, in the non-draft minutes. I don't minutes. know where that number came from. I don't know what it... Didn't come from Bill. No. I know it didn't. And it struck me. I said, what? <laughs> Anyway, I'd, as a strict cutting out something, I would definitely uh, right. ask that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so with that change proposed, uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. Oh. Did I miss something? No. I'm, okay. no, no, no. Yeah. All those in favor of the minutes, uh, approving the minutes, say aye. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm abstaining. I was we have a lot of abstainers. Three that were there. Oh, we have new board members. New board All board right, board. so those of us who can vote, who, how many of us can actually vote so on this motion? Be me, Suzanne and Marie. <laughs> and me. All right. All those in favor of approving the minutes with the change, raise your hand. The I'm going to yeah. abstain because I, I, I'm comfortable with the rest, but I don't All right, so, so we have voting in favor, Lorraine, right. Peter, and Suzanne. Although I would share, I, I also had some issues. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take that up at, at, a, at a later time. Uh, and then uh, how many are abstaining? All right, uh, so the um, motion passes unanimously by a vote of three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. All right, are we up to bills? We are up to bills. Or up here, we never finished five and six. Oh, okay. Um, while we are continuing, um, uh, we're going to go back up to letter B and uh, numbers five and six on our agenda. And actually, we, we won't take action on these tonight, but we will uh, at our next meeting. But I do want to discuss. Where are, where are you going, Peter? Sorry. We are at, under letter B, numbers five and six. Starting off with number five, establishing regular board meeting dates and times. Uh, each year we have the opportunity to discuss this and change this if we would so like. Um, there are at least two board members who would be interested in the change due to certain conflicts. Uh, there are others who would not. Uh, this was arrived at as a general consensus time and date. It's what we've been accustomed to. Um, but I would like to throw it out there as are people interested in, in a change. Lorraine is. Uh, Lorraine has a conflict on the first and third Mondays. Um, I also have uh, conflicts on the first and third Mondays. Um, but both for Lorraine and I, these aren't hard fixed conflicts. Um, for Perry, we, so we talked about moving to the second and fourth Mondays. Uh, Perry does have a hard conflict because he is a select board member in um, Ripton, which is why he's not here tonight. However, I sent him word to please also discuss this at his select board meeting. There's only three of them to coordinate. <laughs> uh, but let me just ask generally uh, about Mondays. Have, are people, do people want to stick with Mondays? Do we want to think about Tuesdays? I'm seeing nobody fighting for any other night besides Monday. And I'm seeing a big nod down here. Mondays are fine. Mm -hmm. They work great. All right. Middlebury Select Board is on Tuesday night usually. So okay. Not that that conflicts with us, but it means there may be some inner. Yeah. Nice to have that. Yeah. 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 Uh, where do people, if we were to propose changing it to the second and fourth Mondays, and I, I bring this up, A, for personal reasons, just because I have conflicts, Lorraine does too, but also I find that we, we have frequent conflicts with the first Monday of the month. It's town meeting night. Um, it's Labor Day or Memorial Day, one of the two, I think Labor Day. Uh, sometimes other things fall on Mondays. Um, so I found we've had to My bump. birthday. Your birthday. Yeah. It's always on a Monday. <laughs> Every year. <laughs> um, so do I hear anybody uh, having a problem with doing the second and fourth? I don't. All right. All right. So um, we will not take action on this tonight, but we will next week and we'll, we'll look and see. Well, I'll continue discussing with Perry, and we might move to the second and fourth Mondays. Unless somebody some, suddenly discovers that that's a problem. Uh, is everybody happy with 6.30? Hearing no objections, we'll stick with 6.30. Uh, okay, committee assignments. Uh, one thing I didn't get done before this meeting was to send out an email to everybody saying this is a time when we can reorganize committees, but I will um, with descriptions of what the committees are and what their charges are. Uh, and um, you know, uh, for our, especially for our three new board members, but we also, like for example, have now have lost two from finance and budgeting. Um, and, <coughs> and what was Nick on? Policy. And Jason was on policy. Finance. 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 finance, right, finance. yeah. Um, anyway, so I'll be sending that out. Please get back to me. If I don't hear from you, I'm going to assume that you're happy where you are and we'll continue along as we have been. 
not on our agenda, but I do want to just bring up and we'll, we'll finalize again next week. So Nick was also one of our two delegates to the Hannaford Career Center Board. Lorraine's the other. Nick would like to stay on the board, appointed by our board. He cannot. I haven't even told him this yet. But what I've learned is that the Career Center Board has to be made up of 60% people who are elected. Uh, and he would not have been elected. So it does need to be somebody from this board. And so I will add that to my list of committee assignments. But if anybody's interested in that, please think about it seriously. And uh, Lorraine can talk a little bit further about it next week. All right, now we can move on to bills. And our um, am I doing? I guess I'm in the middle of the Okay, so uh, Ruth and I signed bills on March 5th, um, a total of $1,535,677.53. Uh, and today, Chip and I signed. Uh, bills. <laughs> I was going to write them down, but she took the picture. Pictures, <laughs> really, but it keeps flipping on me. Okay, so let's see. Two, we had two food service. Um, one for twenty-three thousand nine hundred forty-four dollars and twenty-one cents. And one for $31,605.30. Yep. And then we had a general fund for $245,203.09. And that sounded like you were moving to, that we approve those bills? I moved to approve those bills. Second. second. And a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Bills are paid. Uh, and we will organize and send out another spreadsheet with folks to sign up to help reviewing bills. Yes, Can I get Josh? Email out to you right now for Monday? Next Monday? For next Monday? Just before we do. I, I can do it Monday. Yeah, I, I can do Monday. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Thank you both. Chip and Victoria doing Monday? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, Next item on our agenda is the report of the superintendent. Uh, we do have a written report. Um, if folks have questions on that, now is the time. Um, and then we also have these uh, quarterly financial reports, which there may or may not be questions with. I turn it over to you, Mr. Superintendent. Okay. Um, so uh, Josh and I presented the new quarterly report to the Finance Committee. Um, here, this is a copy of it. Um, Josh, do you have anything you want to add about the report itself? Uh, I don't. Um, just one note uh, as far as the projected year at surplus, uh, just for comparison's sake, in FY17, our surplus was $1.5 million. And next, I think this year we're projecting $153,000. So that's just a reflection of how our budgeting has changed uh, and trying to budget more accurately. So that's the goal. But it basically means we will not have a huge surplus at the end of the year. Damn. Uh, so I, I saw that bottom line. I said, wow, they really are budgeting carefully. But in your description, it's really, there's a lot of ups and downs that I assume you did not know about as you were planning your budget. Yeah, definitely. And there's still, so right now, through two major, major variables we have out there. The SEER reports that they just finished, and I've been seeing a whole bunch of journal entries to redistribute. Uh, special education personnel based on time studies that the state does. So we do one in October, and we do one in <coughs> February, and those two are averaged together, and then we just have to distribute the person's cost for the entire year based on those averages. Uh, so that will be updated for the next, for the third quarter report. Um, and then the other piece is healthcare costs, and we should have some information for January uh, so we can start to get a little more accurate. Right now we're just budgeting 80% of the HRA costs, um, which is just a wild guess. So. Other questions from folks before I ask another question? Uh, so I'm always curious about the value or the cost of 
um, sending the bus over to, does it go all the way to Rochester now? No, no. Just, okay, goes just goes right to Hancock and, and picks up right there. Does it go to Granville? No, I believe it just, I believe it just picks up right at the bottom of the hill. I think it goes to Granville. We, I think we signed bills for transportation to Granville. Yeah, I'm pretty. I, I'm, I thought so. Yeah, I, I just, yeah. It's pretty expensive. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, I think it's I think it's forty thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah. And I I assume we are monitoring its worthwhileness each each year. So we're well, we're well above Randall that. Students bring in about five hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Seems like a pretty good investment then. Yes. Uh, and um, you know, at some point, it'd be great to get a breakdown. Uh, yeah, those numbers probably will grow as Rochester, I think next year will close its middle school. They've now closed their high school. Um, so we probably ought to look at the value of actually sending the bus down to Rochester too. Although that's kind of a T and that might hurt the Granville, the Granville kids. Um, and I just, just to be aware, I know that uh, Harwood is also sending a bus down. So they're, I'm not sure who's getting on what bus, but it'd be interesting just to know from a competitive standpoint well and and bill did go over to Rochester right. recently to talk with the community about muhs and yeah and we picked up a few rochester kids this year after they closed yeah at the, at the time that i went over there we were the only school sending the bus over. okay and it, it goes into hancock there's a smoko station on yeah 100, and that's where it goes they would be interested in it coming all the way into rochester to to the school because that would be central. Yeah. Great. Peter. Yes. It seems like in these discussions, especially in these, we're, we're dealing with that part, but there's other parts in the state that have similar issues probably in consolidation and closing of the very small high schools especially, but I, you know, in this competition, so to speak, Obviously, it relates to a lot of different things, including how do you get there and get back every night? Uh, what's the academics and what's, what benefits do you get out of it? So, I mean, it seems like we should have a little more information on on that type of thing, not just the money part, but uh, I know, you know one of the football captains was from Granville, okay, or Hancock. So, I mean, the kids are coming over and making a big impact on our school as being uh, participants and i think we not just from the money of what we can get you know luckily yes we do get paid for them coming but uh, i think we need to have a better understanding how many bill maybe you know that what what's the high school population class population is it 10 or 20 or for rochester for rochester yeah yeah it was pretty small pretty small but they had are you talking about all three towns or just Rochester? No, I mean the towns that went to Rochester High School. So Hancock, Granville as well. Yeah, I mean, the Rochester High School was pretty small. Oh, I know it was. Nine through 12, it was uh, like 20 yeah. students. Yeah, I think it was 18 is what 18. I heard. There were 18 kids. For the entire school? Yeah. The entire school. But you're, the question you're asking no. is how many kids are we getting coming over from Hancock, Granville, and Rochester we're to the high not, school? We're not finished with the enrollment process, but we've had um, I think of two or three that have come through and visited um, the school since that particular evening. Yeah. Uh, did that answer the question? Yeah, that? no, I, I was trying to get some. Yeah. I knew it was very small. I just didn't know what the the level is. I yeah. still think we should be I think a, a aggressive in looking at those situations uh, because this is a problem for those types of communities and we should, for those children in those communities, make it as good an experience as we can relative to transportation and environment and everything else. Not just for the money and the increase in our numbers, but because that's what we should do. Well, maybe we'll uh, ask for a report as some agenda item in, sure. the, in the future. Not an action item, but just an agenda there, report. There is also an impact on Ripton as well. Right. And, you know, Ripton is and really, bus. Ripton is where this started um, in terms of get the idea of sending a bus and having kids from Hancock and Granville come. So that, that's been a pretty significant source of uh, enrollment at Ripton. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Anything else on quarterly financials for us? Uh, I think so. If you could uh, up that surplus though, that'd be great. <laughs> well, I, I guess I, 
I mean, we've got just one note, and I think I, I mentioned it um, at the, on the bottom line of expenditures. I added the retirement option A's, which is going to be at maximum $300,000. We're still waiting for information from Vistas, which is Vermont State Teachers Retirement System, uh, to confirm what that number would be for the five teachers who took that option. Uh, and we did set aside money in the Ed Reserve, I believe $200,000, to help offset that. We don't need to as of right now, and the board has the ability to make that adjustment whenever they want if we can get to that line. But that is actually, without that option A, we'd be at 40 degrees. So. Okay. Great. So second item here is our 21st century grant application and I wanted to um, just let the board know about the work we're doing in um, attempting to get a 21st century grant which would provide um, significant after school and extracurricular support in a number of our schools and I want Caitlin to share a little bit about that. She's been spearheading that with a number of our principals. Yeah, um, so we submitted an application in early February at the deadline, and we will, we're in a holding pattern, just waiting to hear whether or not we receive the grant. We should know by the end of April. 21st Century Learning Center grant is, um, the, the idea is that the school system, specifically schools that qualify for Title I funding, so for us that's Bridport, Mary Hogan, Salisbury, and Shoreham, partner with, um, local community organizations to provide after school and summer programming for students. So uh, the principals of those Title I schools and I and Erica Gardner, our, our community coordinator, collaborated on the application. Um, if we get it, the first thing that we will do is hire a director for the program. It's written into the grant and it's a, it'll be a, um, it was maybe a 0.8 full-time position as we wrote it. So it's a, it's a real job. And um, and then each of the sites would also have a site-based coordinator as a part-time position organizing all of that work. We've partnered with Mary Johnson Children's Center in our application. So if we receive the grant, they will provide the stable, regular, after-school child care and summer child care programming. And that will form the basis for us to then have students with easier access to tutoring with teachers, um, with licensed teachers, and enrichment programming in STEM and STEAM and athletics and um, the arts, instrumental music. So we have a series of community partners who have expressed interest in collaborating with us. They include um, Middlebury College Center for Community Engagement, Middlebury Community Music Center, Ilsley Public Library, the Salisbury Public Library, <coughs> the Platt Memorial Library in Shoreham, Hannaford Career Center, Middlebury Community TV, Addison Community Athletics Foundation, and the Town of Middlebury Recreation Department are just groups that have said that they're interested in partnering with us to provide enrichment programming for our students. So we have a lot of work to do to actually firm up what those partnerships will look like if we get the grant. Right now, we're just being hopeful that it will come through. Any questions? Uh, it, this is a, not a one-time grant. They provide multi-year funding yes. so that you don't know, start it and then all of a sudden we have to... Great question. The, it's a five-year grant. They fund us at 100% of the, of the request, ideally, for the first three years. In the four, and, then they, and then the task is to build sustainability into it. So in year four, we would be funded at 75%, in year five at 65%, and then we have the option of reapplying for funding for another five years at 50%. So it gives us time to locally fund and otherwise grant fund the systems that we build over time. And this is federal money, right? It's federal money. So that, that, that's always a big question mark. Whether or not it will be stable? Yes. And available, yes. yes. I, I know that in the to be more. in the president in the president's recommended budget, uh, the money for 21st century is zero. However, it's a very popular program because it it's nationwide and it's got a lot of constituents that um, support it. Any other questions? Um, I do have a question. Um, yeah. You said uh, it's the Title One schools, but are only children that qualify as Title One schools are they the only participate? Yep. Or can all the children at that school? All, all students would have access to it, and they would have um, 
different levels of financial support to access that. So through Mary Johnson Children's Center, they would support get, um, getting child care subsidy to families that qualify for it. Um, but we, the grant has written in subsidies for a lot of the enrichment programming as well. So it would be for everybody. Any further? All right, thank you. Uh, okay, next on our agenda is sort of the final step in our budgeting process. Uh, and this is um, part of the master agreement between um, the board and our educators. This is pursuant to Article 15.1 of the master agreement uh, that we need to approve the reductions in force or reductions in these positions um, as outlined in our, in our budget. And um, so I'll take a motion to approve it, a second, and then, come, then we can have discussion. Moved. Lorraine moves. Second. Second. Chris seconds. All right. Um, discussion, and I'm a, do you want to speak to this a bit? Sure. Um, so we've talked a lot about this, um, I'd say, over the, probably the last two months, um, maybe even three months. And Part of the, the complication this year in terms of getting to this date um, and not doing this as part of the budget process, which is ideally when this would happen, um, was a result of our February 1 deadline for early retirement. So because of that, this whole process has been moved um, to later than it, it probably will in the future in years that we don't offer that or we move that February 1 deadline for early retirement earlier. So that's just just to let you all know that in terms of process, this is hopefully something that we won't have to, to do again where we go through the budget process and then we have to, to work with this afterwards. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about the reductions at, um, at both, at all of our schools. Um, there have been lots of questions about um, both at MOMS and MUHS where they were waiting to find out about retirements to, to make final decisions. Um, both of those principles um, are prepared to talk tonight if, if anyone needs them to, to just share a little bit more about what their thinking was. I have shared that um, with the board as well, so I think everyone understands the challenges that there's, there's never a right cut. Um, this is a, a really hard thing when you look at, at all your staff and you have to try to figure out, you know, a, a reduction here has an impact over here. That um, Kids earlier tonight were talking about the effects in systems, and that's really what principals are doing in their buildings. Uh, when we started this budget process in the summer and we were talking about process, I shared with our leaders that I would be working to figure out where we needed to be with the budget based on uh, board direction, and that I would also support them in really understanding their schools and the needs of their schools in determining where those cuts might be. Um, and so I, I feel confident that um, our principals did go through a process where they did assess, again, in, in looking at, at positions, where, where can we reduce, where we can um, continue to provide the services that students rely on, um, and also look ahead to next year and the year after as they think about um, kind of where they're going in terms of the direction of um, IB and the school as a whole. So I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I think um, principals can share briefly too if that is what the board would like. Chip? Can I make one point relative to uh, just the general uh, function of the board? Uh, in the presentation at the annual meeting, Ruth had some questions from the audience regarding budget and, riff, and riffing and, and all of that. And I think she made the point well that the difference with this unified board now is we're a little different level of how the board impacts directly on these types of uh, issues relative to what all of us may have been experienced from all the boards we've been on or are represented in the other towns. It doesn't say we sort of take away that general responsibility because we're obviously voting on it. But I think the, uh, to, to me, the important part for the board is to do just as you said. We're telling the administrators that this is their job and your job to present us with something that we can accept, rather than sitting around and having some discussion about trying to weigh one versus the other in a very detailed and fragmented 
at times way. It may not always be easy for the public to understand, or for a lot of us, actually, but it is where we have put ourselves, I think, by consolidating uh, into a board of this type. I, I just can't, as a board member, I can't be, arg not arguing, but uh, trying to understand every single school, the balance in that school, all the ways that the uh, each principal would have to decide that. So I make that point before we start talking. Thank you. Further comments or questions from the board? Steve? Um, <clears throat> when we started this whole process, looking at everything, um, one of the things that we were told was that the ratio at Mums was higher than any other school, um, and that what we needed to do there was look at changing, like reteaming or something like that, and, and, and we thought that that was what was going to be happening there. Um, what I'm seeing here is that not a single core teacher is cut, and yet we are losing library and media special. I, I mean, this looks like, again, around the edges rather than the core, which is kind of what we were told needs to happen at the middle school. Um, and I understand we want to leave that, you know, up in the discretion of the people that are running the middle school. Um, but then I compare that with the high school, which is doing what we said, what they said they were going to do, is declining enrollment. They're hitting, um, you know, they're, they're making substantial cuts in uh, core um, areas. And, and I, I wonder if you could speak to why the difference, um, because what we were told before is different than what I'm seeing here happen. So. See, one small question. You meant to say that the ratio was low, right? Not yeah, high. yeah. Well, yes, that, 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 that we had uh, more teachers per student at the middle school. Or fewer students per teacher. staffing was high, is, is what I was trying to so the um, and Chris can chime in here, but I think I can I can answer this. Um, so in looking at moms and looking at the reductions and and the work that's happening now with international baccalaureate, um, Chris felt that the reducing a team going into next year and and as you know and as is talked about, I mean, what my first year here. Um, in my first, one of my first UD3 meetings, that same conversation came up about reducing a team. So our enrollment is going down. It's something that we know is not going away. We, we have to continue to, we're gonna to continue to look at that, uh, most likely, especially if our enrollment continues to drop. But looking at next year and the, the work that's underway at MOMS, Chris felt that these three 3.0 three, um, 3 reductions at MOMS would be better for next year's work that MOMS has to undertake to make the transition to International Baccalaureate than reducing a team and moving everything around, um, which would have a significant impact. Reducing a team at MOMS changes the structure of the school, and they've looked at a lot of different models uh, to determine what, what a three-team model would look like. There's, you know, there's not necessarily one direction you would have to go. There are a number of different things that, that could change. Uh, given the amount of change that we're already undergoing, I, I think Chris's intention is to limit the amount of change happening and also provide the, the support for students next year in the core classroom. So this is, we are, we're losing some support, as you mentioned, on the, on the outside of, of that metaphor. Uh, but there's also kids are getting that in the core teams. So. Uh, again, it's one of those analyses of, of a system and trying to figure out for next year what, what makes the most sense. And it's, it's a really hard argument to have to, to say, like I said earlier, these things you have to really, you know, that, that's where I said I put the trust in the principals is that they're in the building, they're talking with staff, they're, they know the school inside and out in a way that um, I, I trust that it's, it's the right decision. I, mean, I trust them too, but it's different than what we were told at the beginning of the budget process. Chief, other questions? So, Dr. Burroughs, so I mean, from what we were told by um, the outgoing librarian who's retiring, I did not take the time this past week to 
check the facts of if if we need a full time librarian or if we can do with a part time. But if we if if that is really the state requirements is that we need to have 0.95 or 0.99, which basically is one full time librarian. How are we covering that? I mean, it says here that um, replacing the retirement at 0.5 and providing support through other personnel. So, is that really going to cover what the state of Vermont requires, or are we going to be finding ourselves in that non waiver area? So, the uh, as you know, the numbers are dropping mm -hmm. at MOMS next year, too. So, they're losing a pretty large class to the high school and a small classes coming in um, so at that ratio which for this year is 0.93 is dropping next year for when this budget is is being enacted so that's one thing that's going to have a slight difference that I, I the ratio might be somewhere around 0.75 or so next year if you look back backwards in our enrollment um, you know our class size averages are starting to trend towards 115 mm -hmm. or so right so that that's a you know a kind of a running 230 at at mums. Uh, in addition, Chris has a plan to have staffing in there all the time. So it's not that there's going to be a librarian there half the time and then nothing else is happening. Um, in terms of the waiver process, that's something that you know is is fairly common. It's not uncommon for school districts to apply for waivers for various reasons throughout Vermont not just librarian positions, there are other positions that are required um, with EQS, the ed quality standards, that's what lays out all these different ratios. Um, school districts frequently use those. If we're turned down, then we will, you know, we have a contingency fund, we can, we can, we can increase that position to what we need to increase it to and, and make changes. So I, I, I don't think it's, um, it's not something that if, if there's an issue or something we can't we can't, um, can't make a change later. Anything further? All right, well, the motion's been made and seconded um, to uh, approve the reduction in force per the agreement. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Nay. And anybody abstaining? We have three abstentions. All right, I know this is sort of the final uh, action in what has been a long and, and challenging process, and I appreciate everybody's attentiveness and thoughtfulness. Uh, we'll move on to some, um, uh, let's see, we have uh, action, review, accept ACSU and closing school districts FY17 draft audits. We did not get any draft audits. We did, because they're coming around right now. <coughs> no, you, they were all a part of the what uh, was sent out in the minutes that all the draft art audits were in the library and the board pack. Okay. Oh, it's in the library. Yeah, the I didn't see it in, uh, under the agenda item. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> so don't put it because they're each about. Yeah. Like yeah. Long. yeah. So I, I have a little hand up. Got it. Around Sorry. And I thought I would just okay. do a, a quick summary on what on the audits in general. Uh, for those of you who are new, and honestly for all of us here, because we can always so use a refresher on everything. Long and lots of numbers and tables and lots of words. So, the first thing that the top of your handout is the Vermont statute, that's 16 BSA 323, that actually directs boards to have a school system audited. Uh, what you will not see in here is that the board accepts or approves an audit. Um, that is something that I think the school districts in our region just have done. Um, you don't have the choice to not approve an audit, it's an independent audit. Uh, I think the acceptance, it was really just so it would be talked about at a meeting is my assumption on how we got to where we are. Uh, so that's just the statute. Um, I just picked Bridport to go through, um, just to, because uh, that was one of the nine that I had. Uh, so, uh, Statutory requirement. Um, the, I'm just going to hit a couple of the items in this table of contents uh, that I have some, some pieces and some parts of copy. So the independent auditor's report, that is what the auditor provides. That's the first section in the 
on it to be received uh, on page, well it's actually page number two, it's probably your fourth or fifth handout. Um, the real the juicy part of the independent auditor report is the opinion. Uh, that's highlighted. Um, and so under opinion, this is where if they found anything um, that they believe did not represent fairly in the financial statements, they would say that. Um, so you can see uh, in their the financial statements referred to above, present fairly in all material respects, the respective financial position of the governmental activities, so on and so forth. Uh, so that's an important part. If it doesn't say that, then you should fire me. This is the uh, highest compliment that they, they can give? This, they, is, this is about as good as it gets, yeah. yes. But it was done in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted. Exactly. That is, that is, yes. that's, that's an emotional auditor. Right yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so the next page, um, and the next section you go to is management's discussion analysis. That is the only unaudited piece of this report. Um, I will be honest, and it's really just a boilerplate thing that most auditors that you hire just fill in for you. Um, and then I have the ability to go in. If there were areas in the audit that, uh, or the financial figures that I wanted to explain, then that's where I would go into depth and explain um, uh, why we were over or under budget in certain areas or so on and so forth. Um, the page that I printed out um, is page nine. Um, and the real uh, piece of information there is table three, and that gives you the fund balance for the year and compares the fund balance for this year to last year. Uh, so for this year for Bridport, their fund balance was $180,126. Um, this year's a little strange for Bridport, and with all of our audits, you'll see that they've shown them all as unassigned or all of, or all of it is committed um, because this is, because all of these districts are transitioning to ACSD and they didn't have information on what, how they're going to be used in ACSD. So uh, we know that information. So when we have next year's one audit instead of nine, uh, these, all these figures will be grouped together from all our audits. Um, moving on, uh, financial statements. The next one is statement E. This is the first document. There's a whole bunch of other statements before that where they take and they group all the governmental activities together, including the fiduciary funds and the governmental funds and lump everything together and give you some balance sheets and they switch the numbers up and give you other balance sheets and so on and so forth. But statement E is the next one that kind of looks familiar to what you guys are used to seeing. Uh, this is revenues and expenditures. Um, the piece I've highlighted here is on behalf payments. On behalf payments are the payments that the state makes to the education fund on behalf of our retirement or our uh, pension plans for teachers. So in Bridport, that cost is $64,197. The auditor shows that in this statement B, it's also reflected in the revenue. So it's really a net wash to us. There's no actual cost to us. Um, just as a note, the current funding proposal puts all the on behalf payments in the education fund. Which means, well, what I was told Friday is that they would then hit our budget. Um, and they are currently about $1.7 million. All, all combined. So call your local legislator and tell them not to go for that. That, that we're not there I yet. I was just going to say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's see, moving on, Schedule 1, this is, uh, so I did, I did make you a copy of the defined pension benefit plan, or defined benefit pension plans. It's about uh, 15, 20 pages of the audit, um, and I highlight where they discuss the payment that they, the state makes on our behalf. Uh, next page is Schedule 1. Um, this is getting closer to what you're used to seeing in our quarterly report. Um, this, however, what's strange about this one is that they actually, the way the auditor does it, is he puts the fund balance on July 1st up in that revenue side. Um, so if you were to take on the third column an actual amounts and reduce uh, that $1.735 million by the $194,000, which is budgetary fund balance, that revenue would equal the revenue that we reported in our um, annual report to report and then all the close out documentation. The expenditures are one million five hundred fifty-five thousand dollars to do match what our numbers say as well. So it's just it's confusing because none of their figures actually match our figures um, because of the way that they're required to count them for GAAP and so and GASB and other accounting recommendations. 
Um, the other piece, they do also go through, so that's basically the general fund. They also go through all the special revenue funds. So for Bridport, there were a handful. Next year, when we only have one audit, the general fund will be short and sweet, and we will have pages and pages and pages of special revenue funds because all of the special revenue funds from all of our schools will be shown. Um, so we'll probably have an area of 40 or, 40 or 50. Um, so it goes through what those uh, expenses, revenues were, and what the fund balance is in all of those accounts. Um, so those are, those are also in all of each individual school district right now. And then the last piece is the independent auditor's report. Uh, it closes out the document, that's your last page. Um, and this is their commentary on, uh, they don't review internal controls, but while they're doing their work, if they see anything that is deficient in internal controls, they will note it. Uh, so the highlighted, highlighted part um, where they say during our audit, we did not identify any deficiencies in internal control that we consider to be material weaknesses, that is a good thing as well. Um, and they also, the next highlighted part is the results of tests, no instances of non-compliance or other matters. Um, in so, high praise. High praise, <laughs> yes. Um, so that's the audit reports. Um, there's one for each old school district. There's one for ACSU as well. Um, ACSU also goes through a federal, um, a, a single audit is what they call it because all of the federal money that we get filters through or filtered through ACSD. Um, and so because we're over a certain, a certain threshold, they had to do a single audit on that, which had similar results as far as uh, being in compliance and uh, barely representing the financial statements. So uh, this is the last year of nine. Next year, we'll just do one. We're excited about. Was uh, any of this sort of chargeable as a Unification expense to the hundred fifty thousand. Nope, no, no, this is all just normal. <coughs> Any other questions? All right. Thanks, oh. thanks for explaining what happened. Yeah, and just giving us one example. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, we have um, half a dozen or so um, every year authorizations to approve. Uh, the first one is um, who is authorized to, uh, to authorize payments and sign director's orders as needed. Um, I think typically we have selected the option of not authorizing anybody or any position specifically, but to say any two board members. Is everybody okay with that? Could I have a motion that we approve this resolution with the option of selecting uh, any two board members and and that also the board of directors request the board distribution of the school financial reports as follows to um, every member of the school board of directors is that we've generally done yes okay and it's electronic so that's great so moved. Okay, move and a second anybody second thank you uh, all those in favor of the resolution and selecting the option of any two board members uh, please say aye. aye aye anybody opposed Anybody abstaining? And we've taken care of resolution number one. Bank account signers. Uh, let me pop that baby up here. Uh, let's see here. This, uh, if you open it, it talks about those who have um, signing authorization. Uh, this does not represent any change from what current practice I assume? Correct. Basically, this is so that in the first paragraph, it gives the superintendent this manager the ability to open and close and view accounts. And everything else, then it goes for every single account and lists who is an authorized signer, which means they can write a check. Uh, this is getting smaller. Yeah. Uh, we are in the process of closing and all of the general fund uh, checking accounts for the old districts. Uh, and some other outstanding, so like insurance and checking is an old ACSU account that we're getting rid of that. Um, all the ACSU accounts will go away. Um, and we're trying to consolidate as, as much as we can. There are some accounts that are on here that just haven't been touched in years, so we're working with the principals to figure out what we want to do with those funds and can we consolidate them, and even just move them into the fund and not have them sitting in our own checking account. And every checking account we have has to be reconciled and then audited every year. So if you 
for the better. All right, so how about a motion to approve uh, the board resolution before us? Easy way to describe it. Well said. <laughs> uh, all right, a second? Second. Second from Lorraine. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? And we've taken care of number two here. Um, you want to explain the Magellan yeah. Fund? <coughs> yeah, so the Magellan Fund is currently uh, assigned to Mary Hogan's or uh, Middlebury ID number four's EIN number, and therefore named Middlebury ID, ID number four, so we need to move it over to ACSD. So this is a resolution that the bank requires to make that change. The, Mag the Magellan Fund is a special fund that Mary Hogan has that remains to their benefit um, that was set up privately, but, but because when we unified, we sort of had to take over the ownership of it, and this just completes the task. Yep. So, so it's purely a titling. Yep. Yep, just transferring the function. Name, it's basically. not, yeah, it doesn't change how the funds are being used. It's in the charter. Right? I know that. I just want to yeah. make sure that's yeah. Yeah. the case. Uh, okay, all those in favor, uh, well, how about a motion to approve the resolution um, for the Magilton Fund name transfer? Motion. Okay. Thank you. Second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? And there we go. Commercial credit card resolution? Yes. Uh, to our principal's great dismay in September, I canceled all of our credit cards. Um, and. <laughs> After many conversations, we're going to bring them back, um, and this is a resolution that People's Bank requires from the board to allow me to open these accounts uh, and then manage these accounts and names the people who are able to manage the accounts, being me, Peter, and Michelle, who are our treasurer. Uh, so this is just a step in that process of bringing those back. The reason we canceled them in the first place uh, was because uh, a large, the majority of the reason was because the vendor we were using basically couldn't perform their duties. Uh, we would get charges that would appear on one statement, disappear on the next statement, appear back, along with late fees. Um, they actually took one of our checks and they deposited it to Icicle Seafoods, which is some company in Minnesota. Uh, so we eventually just- We're now shareholders. <laughs> enough is enough, so we got, we stopped that. 3,000 cases of frozen cod arriving. So we're bringing, we're bringing them back. Uh, this vendor, it's People's United Bank. And one of the benefits is the company we were using uh, was in Montreal, was Bank of Montreal, um, but they were difficult to get the same person, get good customer service, where at People's we can just drive to their branch in Williston. Uh, that's where this uh, credit card service staff is located and put our, put our hands on it. All right, a motion to approve the ACSD resolution concerning commercial credit cards. Moved by Lorraine. Second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor of the ACSD resolution concerning commercial credit cards, please say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Done. And how about a quick uh, explanation on the Vermont yeah. gas easement? Uh, so we have been talking to Vermont Gas about putting gas lines in for Mary Hogan, similar to what we just did for Moms and MUHS. Uh, also putting dual fuel burners, uh, where we would get a return on investment in I think a year and a half. Uh, based on current fuel prices. Uh, before we do any of the burner work, we'll come back to you and have you authorize that. It'll be part of the capital, one of the capital projects that we're gonna do. Uh, but this just allows them, gives them the right to put their lines in so we can move down that process. Uh, motion to uh, approve the resolution relating to the deed of easement for pipelines. Second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. And abstentions? All right, thank you. Uh, do you have printed copies? I see these all need signatures. Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, this requires one, two, three, four, five school board members, it looks like? Yep. All right, so you may want to send those around. All right, our final uh, item on the agenda is a, just a quick discussion about board member training. Um, as we sort of talked about things previously, that we are trying to keep our second meeting of the month committee work first, followed by um, sort of board training. And so our second meeting of the month is next week. 
as the way March unfolded and the challenge of having first and third Mondays, which we discussed previously. So we'll plug there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so um, Peter and I are kind of working on, a, um, on an agenda that will largely focus on kind of, uh, kind of standard information for us, such as a little bit of our history, how we came to unify. Some of this is very apropos to our newer members, but I think it's worth um, talking about for all of us. Um, the role that we have, the role that the superintendent has, the role of principals, uh, the role of policy, how policy is developed. Um, give me some other topics. Essential work of school boards, the, the VSBA work. Yeah, the VSBA, essential work of school boards. Uh, and so it's gonna be somewhat basic, but I think a good refresher for all of us. Robert's rules. We're gonna talk a little about Robert's rules. Um, so that we begin our new board uh, sort of all on the same page as to where we came from, where we're going, and how we operate. So that's, that's gonna be the topic. Um, we'll finalize an agenda and get it out to you. We're gonna sort of keep it in-house. Uh, Peter, Lorraine, uh, Perry, and I will take on different parts of this um, as we do it. So that's, that's the end of our discussion on board member training, I think, unless anybody else has anything to add. Yes, Steve. Um, do you have any ideas about what we would do with that retreat? Well, this is what we're going to do next week, but part of the agenda includes retreat. Yeah, thank you. That was one of the items I didn't mention. Yeah. Uh, all right. Anything else to bring up? All right. We, we will make our two-hour uh, deadline here. How about a motion to adjourn? So moved. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Aye. We stand adjourned. Thank you all very, very much. And do I have everyone signed MOUs? Oh, yeah. Do you have MOUs? And then um, uh, Josh needs five, at least on one of these. I got that. Got that. All right, good. Good. I'm not MOUs sure. can go on my computer.